Everybody, let's uh, stand and worship, shall we? Holy Spirit, come.
In times of joy, in times of peace, in times of sorrow, in times of grief, your still small voice can speak so
Lord, thank you for the day that you've given us. We just ask uh, you to take this time of worship and just see it as a pleasing offering to you, Lord. Just ask that you bless us and uh, be with us as we continue the day. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Vineyard. We're glad you're with us this morning. Good morning to everyone online and everyone here in, uh, in DeKalb. Uh, if you're visiting us for the first time, or if you're visiting us for the first time online, hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, feel free to just drop us a line. Say, uh, whoa, I'm a little hot. Um, drop us a note on, uh, on Facebook in the comments. Let us know you're here. If you go to our website, vineyarddecalb.org, um, you can click on the top. There's a button that says connection card. Click on that. Fill one out and just let us know you're here. We'd love to send you a thank you gift for uh, either being here live or... Uh, on the, on the stream. A couple real quick announcements. Monday nights we do prophetic uh, ministry time. If uh, you are interested in getting prophetic prayer, um, just go to our website. If you go into the calendar section, vineyarddecalb.org, you can click on there and sign up for one of the appointment times. We offer three appointments, uh, 6, 6.30, and 7. Um, click on one of those, sign up. We would love to pray for you. It's a powerful uh, time, a great time to get some ministry and possibly Hear from the Lord as well. Uh, Wednesday night, we are gathering at the church down in the fellowship hall for a time of uh, a little bit of worship, a little bit of devotional, and a time of prayer and ministry. So I invite you to feel free to come. Um, we're thinking about how to possibly stream that in the future. We're not quite at that technical savvy as of yet, but uh, feel free to come by on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, Friday, we're continuing our traveling bonfire event, and this time we're going to Jeff Carl's house. Uh, Jeff is in DeKalb if you want to join us for a bonfire. It's a lot of fun. It'll be 7 o'clock at Jeff's house. There's information on our website, vineyarddecalb.org. And then finally, um, James asked me to put out a kind of a help wanted. We, we're blessed, as you all know, with this beautiful building and with this beautiful piece of land, but with land, with what's that saying from from Spider-Man, with, with, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. With great land comes great responsibility, a.k.a. cutting grass. So um, James is trying to get a team together so that the burden doesn't just fall on one person individually. We have all the equipment to make the lawn look beautiful, or at least cut, uh, here at the church. So if you are interested in helping... Send a message to James or email the church, info at vineyardsdekelb.org, and I will get that uh, message to James so that you can get on the team so we can get the lawn looking nice and beautiful. Um, this is the normal time of our service where we would be taking our tithe and offering. Most of that is done now electronically. Uh, there is an offering box in the back. Let me pray for a moment um, just for the offering as we accept it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the good gifts that you've given us. And Lord, we just give back to you. Father, bless the offering, bless the tithe. Lord, we know that as, um, as we are faithful to you, you are faithful to us. So Father, I just ask, as we give, Lord, we pray for provision, not just for us in the church, but Lord, for each one of our families. We pray that you continue to bless them, that you continue to take care of them, that you continue to supply all of their needs. So Lord, we thank you, for we know that we are in your hands. Lord, we know that you... You have uh, everything that we need. So, Lord, bless the tithe, bless the offering. 
We give it to you, and we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, over the last, gosh, couple of weeks, we've been going through Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, We're about the halfway point of the letter. Getting better at drinking water while being masked. Um, We started this shortly after Easter. And at that time, um, all of this was kind of fresh and new. We were only a couple weeks into uh, what would become the defining event of 2020. And I was really pressing into the Lord at that time. Um, We were wrapping up uh, our journey through um, through uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, and we were beginning to uh, just kind of focus on Holy Week and on Easter. And I was really pressing into the Lord at the time, saying, okay, Lord, where do you want us to go? Because I, I knew that no matter what the future held, it was going to be a challenging time, and I knew that the Lord's Word always has things to speak into those moments. And as I was praying and pressing into it, the Lord continually just put Philippians uh, in my mind just kept saying, go into Philippians, go through Philippians. And so I thought this would be a very beneficial uh, book, a very beneficial letter for us as we began a journey into the unknown. And, and quite frankly, this has been a journey for most of us into the unknown. We, we didn't know what we were getting into, and, and quite frankly, we really don't know how this is all going to end when we come to the end of it. I spoke with a pastor friend of mine last week, and um, he made a comment to me that when this first started, he kind of looked at everything that was happening around him in these three or four week windows. He figured that in three or four weeks, everything would be taken care of. Everything would be back to normal. We just had to survive three or four weeks. And, and because of that, he's never been able to really look beyond that. And he's realizing that it's not three or four weeks. Those three or four weeks have turned into three or four months. And, and they keep going and going and going. Normal always seems to be escaping us. You know, at the beginning of June, everything seemed to be optimistic. Things were beginning to open up. But now, the news around us is becoming less optimistic. We look at what's happening in the South, in the Southwest, part of our country. And we wonder. Last week, a dear friend of mine who pastors a church in southern Illinois posted an email or posted a Facebook post that uh, I can tell you is the biggest fear that I have. They made a discovery the Monday after church service, and they've been meeting for quite some time, that both her and her husband had tested positive for COVID. And they're in a small town, and rumors kind of spread across that town. Somebody was positive. Who was positive? And so midweek, she had to write a letter to not only the church, but to what appeared to be the entire community. People had to rush and get tested. Everything had to shut down all of a sudden. And, and, you know, that's down southern Illinois, where supposedly none of this is happening. It it kind of struck me as the reality of, of what is around us, what at any minute can kind of break. And as we look in our own community, we're beginning to see numbers starting to rise again. And and it kind of leads to that question, what happens next? What's the next thing that we have to try to overcome? What's the next challenge that's in front of us? And as we look across the country and across the world, we see other challenges that are rising. Last week, the government of California and the United Kingdom, England, requested churches no longer to sing. And there was an uproar about that. And it led me to this question, how do we respond when everything that we know, when everything that we're comfortable with, with everything that we tend to put our security in has the risk of going away or possibly going away again? How do we deal with that? Once again, Philippians has this amazing way of speaking right into that question. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we dig into your word, Lord, begin to speak to us right now. Allow us to hear from you clearly. 
Lord, give us words of wisdom. Give us words of comfort. And just speak to our hearts. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Just pray all this in Jesus' name. Philippians 3 begins with this. It says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and, who, and put no confidence in the flesh. For those of you who are familiar with this letter, you kind of know what, what is about to happen, where Paul's about to go. We're about to move into a section of Philippians that is all about warnings. Paul is about to warn them of things. But before he gets there, he wants to make sure that they are in the right mindset. Notice what he, what he does in, in verse 1. There, there's this word that just seems to come out again and again and again throughout this book, and it's here again in, voice one, in verse 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. If there's one word that defines this book, that's the word. You might not have noticed it, but this is about the fourth time this word has come up. And we're only at the beginning of chapter 3. Rejoice in the world, in the Lord. Paul is challenging them to change their default response. Now remember the previous couple of weeks. Paul has been warning them about grumbling, about complaining, even in times of difficulty. Last week he gave us examples of what it looks like to persevere, to press on. What it looks like, uh, what, a, what a good, solid walk following Jesus looks like in the life of Timothy and in the life of Epaphroditus. Sorry. And even so, in the midst of all of those difficulties, when things are, seem to be going wrong, and even in those two lives, we see this picture of rejoicing. And there's a warning Paul's trying to get into us right now. We need to be careful. When things don't seem to be going the way that we planned, we need to be careful of our response. Now, Paul is calling them to rejoice, but he says it in a very different way. Notice what he says here. Further, my, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again and again, and it is our safeguard. It is a safeguard for you. Paul's calling us to rejoice. He's calling us to a place of worship, to rejoice before God. And he's explaining it to us in such a way where he's saying that rejoicing, that attitude, that worship of God, it is a safeguard for you. Think about what he's saying here. Our outward response, how we deal with the world, is dictated by the condition of our hearts. A couple weeks ago, he brought this on. Remember what, what we said, what we focus on, we become. And I used that great analogy about how coming to work, someone or coming to church uh, this morning, or a couple mornings ago, someone cut me off, and it kept me in a bad attitude. And that attitude kind of like dictated the rest of my day. I was grumpy. I was upset. What we focus on has a way of taking over our lives. And Paul's looking at them, and before he gets into the warnings, into the challenges, he says, rejoice. Focus on rejoicing in the Lord. Take a posture of worship. And when we take that posture of worship, no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what's happening around us, we tend to be focused on Christ. And that affects our disposition. That affects our response. That affects our attitude. That affects everything within us and around us. It's our safeguard. It's our check. So what's the problem? What's the issue that Paul is dealing with here? You see it, the early echoes of it in verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. 
Paul is talking about here is something called the Judaizers, this idea uh, that was prevalent in the early church that to fully be a follower of Jesus, one had to become Jewish first. And what that means, especially for men, is that one has to become circumcised. See, they believed that Christians needed to follow every aspect of the Jewish law, especially circumcision, or else they weren't really Christians. They couldn't possibly be saved. That's what Paul is alluding to here with the word mutilation. There's actually a fun word play between uh, verse 2 and 3 on the word mutilation and circumcision. It's a very similar word. It sounds the same, except one means circumcision to cut around, the other means to cut off. And so he's doing a word play to kind of get their attention on what he's trying to say. We miss it in English, but it's there in the Greek. And, and this is an incredibly important issue. It's such an important issue that the apostles actually dealt with it in Acts chapter 15. The first church council of all time, the Council of Jerusalem, dealt with this issue. Do new believers, do Gentile believers need to be circumcised? Or is faith in Christ enough? And they came back with an answer. They said that faith was enough. They said you don't need to become circumcised. You don't need to become Jewish to follow Jesus. But this issue comes over up again and again and again. We see it all throughout the epistle. It doesn't go away. This idea that there has to be more. There has to be more. Paul's letter uh, to the Galatians is all about this. And in his letter, he comes up with this argument of it's either uh, the circumcision is, is saying that you need Jesus plus. That to be saved, it's Jesus plus. And Paul keeps saying it's not Jesus plus. It's only Jesus. It can't be Jesus plus. Now, for us today, we think it's a non-issue. You don't hear about circumcision in the church. Circumcision tends to just be a personal preference, something that parents possibly do. But the problem is, is that spirit, that same spirit that echoed in the early church about circumcision, that same spirit about Jesus plus, it's still here today. And it's all around us. It just looks different. Oh, yes, yeah, so we can make fun of the churches that, you know, down south, snake handling. Uh, there's some churches that believe in snake handling. That's, you prove your faith in Jesus by if you can pick up a snake or not and not get bitten and die. And we look at that and we say, well, that's extreme stuff. And we see that and we point at that and go, oh, that's wrong. But the problem is we allow that spirit, that Jesus plus spirit, into other areas of our life. We say that people are saved by faith, but at the same time we tell them, yes, you're saved, but to really be a Christian, you need to stop swearing or stop drinking or stop smoking or stop dancing or stop blah, blah, blah. We have this idea that somehow the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life isn't enough that we have to take over that role and point out everything that they're doing wrong and everything that they need to do different. But there's something even more interesting that's happening right now in our society. It seems like that, it, that spirit, that same spirit that was here is increasing even further. And we seem to be missing it. Look, we're dealing with a lot of challenges right now. We're dealing with challenges on how we gather together as a church. We're dealing with challenges of what's safe and what's not safe. And no one likes it. I mean, let's be blunt. We don't like any of this. We, we want to go back to what it was. But when we find things that we don't like, when we find things we, we struggle with, we tend to want to verbalize them in black and white terms, in right and wrong terms. You know, I've been yelled at <laughs> by, by so many different people about what we should and should not do. Opening the church means that we really don't love people because we're not worried about their health.
But if we don't open the church, then we're bowing a knee to Caesar, and we really don't love Jesus, and we're really not following him properly because Jesus would command us to open it. That's just one level. We can take it. I mean, what road do you want to go down right now? There are no winning situations. See, we have this idea. We take the models that we're used to using, the things that we're comfortable. For example, meeting in a building. And we turn them into something more than they were actually designed to be. See, the building here is a tool. It's a tool. That's all. It's a tool for us to preach the gospel, for us to gather, for us to do things, to, for us to follow Jesus. But the building is not following Jesus. It's just a tool. But the problem is, is when times get tough, when times get difficult, we take the tools, we take the models, and we morph them into something that they were never meant to be. They all of a sudden become the focus of our faith instead of tools that help us move forward in our faith. So then all of a sudden you start hearing things. If we don't do dot, 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 then we are truly not following Jesus. Fill in the blank with whatever thing you've read on Facebook lately. And you know what? It's not just this. It could be anything. It could be politics. It could be social issues. If we don't dot, 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 then we're not really following Jesus. See, that's the Jesus plus thing all over again. That's this idea that Jesus needs, we need Jesus, but we also need Jesus and all this stuff. And there's a danger on that. Because as we focus on what we've lost, as we focus on the challenges that we're facing, we tend to lose focus on Jesus. You know, this brings us back to what Paul started. Rejoice in the Lord. Focus on him. There's junk all around you. Focus on him. See, Paul realizes that everything we do, the way we do our service, the way we sing, our building, everything, that none of it is truly essential. See, in times like this, what we need to figure out is what actually is essential. What is essential in our faith? What's important? What do we really need to focus on? And the beautiful part is he lays it out right in front of us in verse 3. He starts off with this, For it is we who are the circumcision. For the Jew, the circumcision was an identifying marker. It's what defined them as being Jewish. It's what defined them as saying they were following the covenant. They were following Yahweh. And Paul is saying our marker is not circumcision. You are the circumcision. Your life, what God is doing in your life is the mark. Not an outward physical mark, but what is happening inside of you. And we see that mark in three areas, and these are incredibly important areas for us to grasp. Notice where he goes from this. We who serve God by his spirit. This can also be understood as service, but it can also be read as worship. We who worship God by his spirit. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 23, when he was dealing with the Samaritan woman at the well, and her argument to him was, you know, well, we believe that God needs to be worshipped on this mountain, and you say that God needs to be worshipped in Jerusalem, so who's right? And Jesus looks at her and says, it, mountains don't matter. Verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will work, worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers God seeks. He looks at her and says, look, it doesn't matter what mountain you're on. What matters is how you're approaching God. 
So, so Paul's looking at us, and he's saying like this. He's saying, it doesn't matter. It, it, what matters is how you're approaching God. Now, we hear, you know, worship in spirit, service in spirit, and that Pentecostal side of us, that charismatic side of us comes out, and we have a picture in our mind of what that means, right? That means like tent meeting. That means like Holy Spirit, people on the floor, people getting ministered up front, laying out of hands, all of this fun stuff. Once again, that's a default to place, to type. Paul wants us to default somewhere else. Notice what he says next. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Worship is not about the songs we sing, or where we are, or who, or even who we are with, those are all external things. Those are all tools. Worship instead about, is about who we focus our lives on. Is it Jesus or is it something else? See, all of that stuff, and look, I love the worship team. I love to worship. I love to sing. I love the songs. But when the songs become more than tools, when the songs begin to define us, when the style we worship in begins to define us, then it morphs into something else that's no longer worship. And that's what Paul is talking about. Our confidence should not be on how we sing or how we cry out or what we look or how we gather. Our confidence, our boast, is in Christ. Not in buildings, not in service, not in anything, but in Christ in Christ alone. And as things get more difficult, as things become more challenging, more tense, what happens in our lives is we feel like we're losing control. Look, when they tell you you can't go out, when they tell you you shouldn't go to the store, when they tell you wear a mask, you feel like you're losing control. I can't make decisions anymore. It's in those moments that we have a choice. And it's in those moments when what and who we truly trust begin to come out. Do we trust Jesus? Or do we just trust all the tools that we've used? Do we trust Jesus? Or do we trust ourselves? See, Jesus isn't interested in how well we sing. I know this for a fact. We did Wednesday night, and I just got this thing from the Lord to sing this old Keith Green song, and there's a reason I'm not on the worship team, guys. There is a clear-cut reason. Scripture says, make a joyful noise, and I, I think God has a really, really broad understanding of what joyful and noise is. Because the noise I made, I didn't think was overly joyful. She just doesn't care how you sing. She just doesn't care what our seats look like. She doesn't care if the stream is working or not. She just doesn't care if we ever get around to painting the wall. She doesn't care. That's not what he's looking for. Instead, he cares about intimacy. He cares about intimacy with you. You, you want to know what that looks like? What true intimacy, what true worship, what, what worshiping, what service to God in the spirit, what boasting on Christ and not on flesh looks like? It's Psalm 23. You've all heard this psalm. We all know this. This is probably the one piece of scripture that everyone for some reason knows and nobody knows what it means. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. 
What you notice there? Hmm. 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 Now we're going to change pronouns. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Even though the world is collapsing around me, I do not fear because, Lord, you bring everything I need. You're protecting me. You're guiding me. You're providing for me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemy, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nowhere in this psalm do you see striving. Nowhere do you see figuring out how to do it. Nowhere do you see them dependent upon, if I can just, Lord, as I walk through the valley of enemies, I know you're with me, but you know what? I, I, I'm preparing for battle. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. No. You're with me. You guide me. You provide for me. You give me all that I need. That's what intimacy looks like. And as everything is falling apart around us, as, as, as I, so we're going to be forced to consider how to do things differently for a while. We need to remember that picture of intimacy, that, that when it's all stripped away, I love that Matt Redmond tune, when it is all stripped away, when all taken away, it's all about Jesus. I always find it interesting how these book series work out. They blow my mind. Look, I, I don't plan these things out tremendously. I take a lot of time early on. I'll read the book several times. I'll read different commentaries. I'll study it. I might even break it into sections. But I never write the sermon until like the week of. And it always amazes me. It always amazes me how relevant they tend to be. And this passage is no different. Look, things are becoming challenging again. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of the challenges and restrictions that people are dealing with elsewhere find their way here. And I think God wants to prepare us for that. We need to keep what's important in front. We need to keep what's essential front and center, not just in our church life, but in all of our lives. We need to remember that it's not about the tools, it's not about the methods, it's not even about where we are. Instead, it's about Jesus, period. It's always about Jesus and Jesus alone. It's about putting our confidence in him, in him alone. Look, anxiety comes from our flesh, it comes from a place of feeling out of control. You're anxious because you can't control things. But peacefulness, security, assurance, joy, those come, from, those come from when we're in a place of intimacy with Christ. So that's what serving God and worshiping God by his spirit looks like. And here's the thing. That intimacy with Jesus can never be taken away, no matter what, no matter where we are, no matter what's happening around us, no matter what's happening outside. It can never be taken away. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence, Lord. There's something out there called Lecta Divina. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Our Catholic friends developed it years ago, centuries ago. And it's this idea of praying through Scripture. And 
So let's just take a moment and let's pray Psalm 23. So as I, as I read this, verse by verse, just bring it into your heart. Ask the Lord just to make this real. Bring a picture of what's happening. Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Lord, we thank you for your provision in difficult times. We thank you that, that no matter what is happening around us, you take care of us. makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Lord, we thank you that in the chaos that's happening around us and in the stress that we're dealing with in our own personal lives, fear and anxiety, Lord, you are with us, that you are taking care of us, that you refresh us, that you lead us in things we know. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. Lord, we thank you that you are our protector. That no matter what the circumstance, Lord, you are always in control. That you are always with us. And Lord, even though there are moments where it feels like everything is falling apart, where it feels like everything is coming to an end, even in the throes of death, Lord, we know that you are with us. Rejoice in what Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain, for we have security in you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Lord, we thank you that you have our backs. that the mockers, the people who make our life difficult, that no matter what, Lord, you are with us, that you still uphold us, you still take care of us. That you shut the mouth of the mockers. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we thank you that your promises aren't only just for now, but they're forever. That you are always with us, that you are always beside us. That we take our security, our comfort, our assurance in you. Now, Holy Spirit, begin to make that real in our Lord, show us the areas where we've put confidence in our own flesh more so than you. And allow us to focus more clearly upon you. Lead us and guide us right now. Draw us to a place of intimacy with you. And be our confidence. Need prayer for anything? We are going to open up the uh, online prayer room again. If you need prayer here, we'll offer it momentarily. But otherwise, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever He may send you. May He guide you in the wilderness. May He protect you in the storm. May He bring you home rejoicing. Uh, may He bring you home rejoicing once again.
We'll see you all next week. We'll see you all later in the week. Bonfires, all kinds of fun stuff. Sign up. Be blessed. Amen.